Namaskar and good afternoon. On this occasion of the 75th anniversary of India's independence, as we understand Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, Chanakya University is pleased to present the inspiration series, Conversation with the Icons of Modern India. Individuals who represent the idea of India on the global stage in pursuit of excellence and firmly rooted in the Indian heritage, they are the inspiration for the young and contemporary India. We are pleased to present to you and very honored to have with us today Sri Mohandas Pai, one of the icons and intellectual thought leaders of the contemporary India. I am pleased to present a brief introduction before we start this conversation. Sri Mohandas Pai is a BCom graduate with a degree in law and a qualified chartered accountant. Has been with a part of Infosys from 94 till 2006 as a board member, as a CFO. And in 2006, he volunteered to lead efforts in the area of human resources, education and research. Sri Mohandas Pai is won consistent awards as the best CFO in 2000Y by IMA India and CFO India by Finance Asia in 2002 and by Asia Money in 2004. He has been a member of several high-powered committees set up by the Government of India and the State Government, specifically the Kelkar Committee for Reforming Direct Taxes, the Non-Western Taxation Committee, the High-Powered Committee on E-Commerce and Taxation. Sir has served as member of the board of the NSE and the SEBI, works with the Union and State Governments in the field of education, IT and business. He has been ahead of the panel formed by SEBI to study the impact of fintech on securities market. Mondas Paisa is also a member on the board of NSE. But one of the greatest accomplishments of him, he has been the founder member of the Akshaya Patra, the redefining movement in India's education and empowerment. Sir has also been very active mentor in the Indian startup community and his other interest also involves educating and mentoring youngsters. Sir has also produced a documentary movie or Sanskrit movie, Punya Koti. But the moment of proud pride for us as a part of the Chanakya University, Sir is a member of the Board of Governors of Chanakya University. So it's an honor to have you with Thank us, you. Sir. Thank you. And may we have a conversation on the context of education in the global <coughs> context, challenges and opportunities for Indian universities. Sir, allow me to begin this conversation with how do we understand the concept of a university? Well, a university is a place where there's a free flow of ideas, there is great debate, there is discovery of knowledge and dissemination of knowledge. So it is a place for intellectual accomplishment, it is a place for intellectual interaction, is a place for learning, is a place for discovery. And that is the place which a university is. It is universal in nature and not confined to any one single field of activity. It enhances human civilization, enhances the quality of life and creates a knowledge-based society. Knowledge is the ultimate power. And that is what our ancients understood when they created a country or a civilization like India. Please remember, India is the only country in the world where the scholar is at the top of the social totem pole. Whenever a rishi came to the court of a king in ancient India, the king came down from his throne, washed his feet, escorted him to a chair higher than him and made him sit down and listen to him. Because the rishis were the repositories of knowledge and creators of knowledge. And they are the ones who spread knowledge. And India has a very rich civilization which had abundant water and abundant resources, had the economic resources for people to devote their entire life to knowledge creation. Like the Greeks had their ancient academies, India had her gurukulas. So we have a rich tradition of education. And I think Chanakya University should further this and become a place where young people come to discover and to understand for themselves and get excited by free thought, by great debates with their faculty, and by interaction and learn how to be good citizens of this world. Great. So I take a point from your uh, point. It says that India had a great heritage of learning and curricular system. It's really heartening to know. But it's quite saddening to know, sir. Where are we now and why did this rich heritage start depreciate over a period of time? What could be the causes for this decline? 
Well, India has been subject to invasions for more than 1000 years. And we must remember that when Alexander came here, maybe 350 BC or thereabout, BCE or thereabouts, he found a very rich civilization and he could not conquer India, though he set out to conquer the whole of the world, but went back from the Indian border, right? And after that, we had the Islamic invasion. The Islamic invasion were by people who were from a desert civilization who had to kill each other and fight each other for survival. They are not known to have created any great universities, though we did see one come up in Cairo much later, right? And they were invaders, they came here. Whenever you are invaded as a country, what do you do? You come and destroy your universities. India had 13 great universities at that point of time, right from Nalanda, Taksila, and Vikramashila, etc. And then you kill all the great scholars because you want to sub, you want to destroy what exists. And you make sure that the intellectual activity comes down, the books are destroyed, the knowledge is destroyed, so that you can rule over a country. That's how you conquer uh, people all around the world and that has been the tradition and that's why we were under this incredible onslaught uh, from the Central Asian countries and other Islamic countries but we survived with the civilization and then we had uh, the British come here and try to implant their own educational system they first supported a Sanskrit schools and then they destroyed it because of the uh, influence of the evangelicals from Great Britain and they tried to supplement their own education system to Macaulay's minutes with scope about creating a nation of clerks to serve the white masters. So even though we had a rich tradition, uh, much of the tradition has been destroyed, much of the scholarship has been destroyed and we have been impoverished the poor country. You must remember that uh, India was the richest country in the world at one point of time and till maybe 1750 or thereabouts, India, China made up 45% of world GDP. And as a rich country, we obviously left, uh, led in the creation of knowledge. Uh, but we know that the British colonial exploitation took away about $45 trillion of wealth in today's money. Usa Patnaik of Columbia University has done a thesis on this and calculated what exactly happened. So after freedom in 1947, we are celebrating the 75th year today, uh, this year, um, you know, we regained our ability to chart our own course in the future. Uh, but sadly, uh, we came under the influence of the Marxists. We closed this country to outside influencers, didn't invest adequately in uh, higher education and education. When Mao took over China in 1949, he made a great statement that uh, women hold up half of heaven and educated China's women. So when China opened up in 1978, uh, China blossomed because women were educated. Uh, Pandit Nehru didn't focus on women's education in this country and till the 90s, literacy was quite low in this country. Any country after freedom must focus on two important things, literacy and primary education, and then secondary and higher education, and then primary health. And both these were casualties in the first 30 years of uh, the Congress rule. And this is history. For example, in 1950, when we got our constitution, we were the richest country in Asia. China was destroyed by the war. Japan was destroyed by the war, Southeast Asia was destroyed by the war. But because we suppressed private capital, we suppressed the people of this country and did not give their economic freedom due to the license quota large and centralization of economic power in Delhi, we only grew at 3.5% a year from 1950 to 1980. Because economic growth is a prerequisite for any country to come up. And India has been a free trade economy throughout our civilization. And that's why we were a rich country and the world came here to exploit and loot us. Right. And uh, the population grew at 2.5 percent in the 30 years. Per capita income grew at 1 percent a year. The world grew at 4.5 percent. Asia grew around 6.5 percent. By 1980, we had become among the poorest countries in the world and everybody looked down upon us. We opened up in 1980. We grew at 5.5 percent in 91 and population grew at 2.25 percent. And our debt grew from 20 billion dollars to 80 billion dollars. And we had a forex crisis in 91, which opened up the economy. Nasima Rao and Manmohan Singh opened up the economy, gave us back our economic freedom. And then it has been uh, India in an upswing. We went from a GDP of 275 billion in 1991 to $3.16 trillion in March 2022, growing at 8.2% a year for 31 years. Not many countries in the world have grown at 8.2% a year in dollar term for 31 years. So we have grown very well. We have invested in education and uh, we'll do better in future but you must understand 
that there are only two countries with a billion plus population, China and India. You can't compare any other country with India and China because nobody has this kind of a huge population, this kind of a legacy of poverty and impoverishment. In 1947, when you got to freedom, the trauma of partition and what we set out to do. Yes, we made certain mistakes. We suppressed our own people. We did not allow entrepreneurship to flourish and we paid a heavy price. But now I think we have passed all that and we will see the rise of a great country and India reclaiming a great civilizational past in the next 25 years. So that, that beautifully explains why, as I say, that the only thing India lacks is confidence. I mean, we understand how the history explains how we started getting intellectually enslaved. So coming to the present, we are in the midst of a VUCA world, a very volatile and uncertain world. How do education, universities brace up for this world, times of uncertainty? See, we are in the knowledge economy globally driven by technology. We are in the digital revolution era. You know, the Industrial Revolution starting from 1750, uh, which led to the invention of the steam engine and the age of machines, created great economic growth for the first time since human civilization started, where the great mass of people could enjoy uh, growth, enjoy economic benefit, higher income, a higher living standard and a longer lifespan with the great advances in medicine and uh, ab ability to tackle diseases. It never happened before. It's the industrial revolution that created an industrial society. It has its yields in some ways, but the benefits were tremendous. And in that era, India was colonized and we missed it, even though we were a rich country at the point of time when the industrial revolution started. Now, we are in the digital era where digitization has created the digital revolution. The world is united together by the internet as a platform where 7.8 billion people on the planet can deal with each other synchronously and asynchronously, get access to information, get access to knowledge. The accumulated knowledge of humankind is available for free on the web to everybody who seeks to learn. Distance has come down and uh, people can get entertainment, education, information, can do business, can do commerce, anything they want on this platform, almost uh, free of cost to a mobile device and a cheap data plan is available to more than five and a half billion people on this planet today. So with all this, we are seeing the rise of great things happening. The world in future is going to be very different. And in this new world to succeed, high education institutions all around the world have to make sure that the students who leave the portals and graduation leave with the innate sense of curiosity intact. What makes a human being the most successful creation of nature uh, in this world? It is the ability of a human being to think, analyze, solve problems, create memory and uh, create innovation because we have the brain power to do this. But what do we do in our higher education, in the traditional industrial revolution era education? Let's go back a little bit. In ancient societies like the Gurukula of India and the Academy of Greece, education was given by a teacher to whose house or academy students went. They stayed with the teacher, the teacher taught them many subjects, there were great debates. It was an interaction between two sets of people, one who taught and one who were taught, right? And now in the industrial era, there was a need for a greater number of people, that is Education 2.0, where people read the books, people wrote the books, and they taught everybody in a large class, and they had a structured program, and you had to pass an examination, you had to cram up many things, information was given to you because they are the ones who had the information, others did not because they are not in the same book. At the end of a particular period of time, you got a piece of paper called the degree and you set forth and got a job and did well. But that was the role of the industrial revolution because you required many, many people because knowledge was the hands of few people. Now the knowledge is available for free. Rich videos are available for free on the internet. You can self-learn, you can do anything, you can know up-to-date research, etc. And the barriers to the growth of knowledge and dissemination have come down. So we are in the digital era. In the digital area, what are the qualities that a human being should have to uh, succeed? To my mind, the qualities are one, you must have a, a bent of curiosity. You must be curious as to why things happen. What are the natural phenomena? What are the man-made phenomena? Why do things happen? And the curiosity is there in all of us as children. 
A child is very curious. A child learns. A child looks up to the blue sky and says, why is the sky blue? We don't ask the question. And the child is curious because it sees uh, the nature with uh, fresh eyes, not contaminated by things stuffed into your hard disk in your mind, right? And then the child learns. When the child comes to school because of the industrial uh, era way of education, you cram it with a lot of information, beat it up and structure it so that the whole focus is on passing an examination, right? Then when you come to college, uh, you still have the same process where the joy of learning goes away and you are suppressed and you are uh, stuffed a lot. And, uh, you know, the faculty is bent on making sure that you come out as a product with almost a dead brain, right? Because they don't make you think. They only make you cram and write down something which is uh, mostly useless because most of what you learn in college, you don't use in your working life. So curiosity is something that you must keep and maintain and uh, you must develop a problem solving attitude. What is the problem solving attitude? An attitude of openness, which accepts multiple ideas, looks at challenges, analyzes data and comes out with the right solution and implement the solution. Because if you have a problem solving attitude, you can analyze most problems that you face when you grow up and do that well. And the third thing, you must have access to information and knowledge. That access is available today. You don't have to have it in your hard disk, memorized, but you should have access. And the fourth thing is you must have, uh, you know, interpersonal skills, skills of communication, skills of talking to people, understanding what people want, etc. Because, you know, you have to negotiate with others when you live in life. And then you must have an ability to assimilate and live in any culture of the world. We are in a globalized world, but the whole world is a stage for every student. And I think a student should be able to go to any part of the world and live there and succeed. Like so many Indians do in multiple countries, because we are a diverse country, which is so very diverse that we can live anywhere and we can understand and solve problems. So these are the qualities a young person should have. And these are the qualities that an education system should imbibe in students. And how do they do this? By making sure there's greater dialogue between the teacher and the taught. By making sure there's greater project work. Making sure there's greater discovery. Making sure that they meet together and analyze and come out with their viewpoints. And making sure that you have a culture of openness, transparency, collegial thought, where teachers, uh, the teachers and the taught mix together and talk. And if you have this kind of an open culture where discovery is encouraged, where self-learning is encouraged, debate is encouraged, questioning is encouraged, you will create a finished product which has a great ability to do well in this world. And that, those are the qualities that are required to succeed in this new world. So great. I mean, a lot of insights from that, uh, <laughs> your talks. Are so by fundamental questions, I was worried about is the role of teacher getting diminished? Are they becoming redundant? But I got an answer for that. But sir, in that context, you have gone from the corporate to the education. So do you advise that universities should go more for backward integration, take people from industry into teaching? Is that one way of looking at how teachers can be enhanced and the learning can be? Teachers are very important. Please remember, in our culture, the guru is important. The guru is one who guides. The guru is one who accepts. The guru is one who shows the way for the, for the student, right? And the guru is one who uh, makes the path easier for the student. The guru is required and, you know, if necessary, the teacher is required. Matra Devo Bhava Guru, you know, Pitra Devo Bhava Guru Devo Bhava. Why do we say that? The mother is the most important, then the father as, uh, you know, the patron, and then the guru, right? right. And uh, the guru's role will never go away. The teacher's role will never go away. But the teacher should change the role from being a controller, a a, a person who is a disciplinarian to a person who is a catalyst to make young people think and do things better. And I think the teacher's role has to change. The teacher needs to understand the requirements of the modern era, the qualities that students should have to succeed and make sure that they work with them to encourage them to grow up. Because please remember for all of us, and we've been through this, um, you know, uh, the age group of 16 to 22 are very important. That's the time when we form a worldview. That's the time when we become confident young people who can tackle the challenges that the world gives you. And to do that, uh, we need to get confidence, we need to get security, and we need to feel comfortable in our own skin. And that is what is going to last you throughout. And that's what the teacher should do as a catalyst. Now, 
should uh, universities get people from outside? I think yes, universities should not be cloisters. Please remember, the university is an organic institution, it's a part of society. The university should reflect the realities of society, the higher aspects of society. It must interact with society. Society should come inside the university. The university should go outside society. After the teachers live in society, students live in society. We must reflect the reality. And it's not necessary that only teachers teach. Because the teachers may not have all the inputs required for the student. So you must get people from outside to talk to students, to teach students particular courses, interact with them. So students know on graduation that when they go out, whatever they have will meet society's expectations. How do you know what is society's expectation when you live in a cluster and when you shut yourself off from the rest of society, right? Because you have to live in society after you finish your education. You have to go out, you have to earn a living and you've got to work together with other people. And the reality of that will only come when we include those people outside into your system. So I'm one for openness. I'm one for outsiders can come and teach part-time, full-time, whatever it is, there's great interaction. Of course, there has got to be a cater of full-time teachers because, you know, teaching is a, is a big task and I think a lot of work has to be done to guide young people. But you have to interact with society. There has to be an osmosis of people from society inside. And I think uh, teachers too should go and uh, spend sabbaticals outside. You know, they must constantly update their knowledge, update what is happening so that they are current. Uh, because, you know, uh, people tell me that the greatest professors always like the freshmen or fresh human classes. When, when students fresh come from school into the college, they like to take the first year because they're the most challenging. Sure. But that's where people come and question you. They ask you questions which you may not know and you learn. Every great professor learns when he interacts with young people because young people's minds have not been filled with all the accumulated thoughts of humankind. The minds are fresh, they'll question everything. And this questioning, like Nachiketa's dialogue with Yama, Yama Raja, is an unbelievable thing. Right? Nachiketa carries on a dialogue and it has got so many facets of learning and the, and the whole concept of a dialogue of questioning by a young person to a great scholar is something that you must carry forward in the universities. That's truly very reassuring. So a lot of teachers out there are looking for how to evolve themselves in the era of digitization. So based on your earlier answer, I think we understand the present era is being driven by in India, the demography, demography, democracy and digitization. In this context, so with the opening up of the education, we have foreign universities coming in and technology disruptions. So what would be the specific measures to go forward in competing this global academic uh, arena? First, we must understand that our children, our young people should have the best education the world can offer. Not the best education Bangalore can offer or Karnataka can offer or India can offer. The best education the world can offer. Because why? They are our children. They are our students, they are Indians and they deserve the best the world has to offer. It's not necessary India only has the best the world has to offer. There are many places in the world which can you know, give them what they want. So they should have the ability to travel everywhere to get educated. And of course it is a ideal situation and you know it costs money. Most people don't have money but we must be open. So we must allow foreign universities of a certain standard to come to India and offer their courses so our children get access to foreign education or education by overseas entities and they are exposed. And there must be internal competition. That's point number one. Point number two, our universities to constantly benchmark with the best global universities and find out what is it that makes them special, what it is that makes them different and why can't we be better than them and like them, and like them. Because all universities have two functions creation of knowledge and dissemination of knowledge to teaching, creation of knowledge to research and dissemination of knowledge. And most uh, universities in this country are disseminators of knowledge, not creators, because of many reasons, lack of uh, money for research, excessive load on the teachers who are tied up, you know, throughout the day, throughout the time they have teaching and correcting papers, a very regimented education system, regimented education system, excessive government control. These are all the challenges which are being done away by the new education policy, which has brought in a great uh, flexibility, right? So now we have to make sure that our faculty too gets an opportunity to learn and to experiment and to be among the best. There's nothing wrong with our faculty. It's just a question of 
uh, you know, getting the exposure and the investment and the ability to transform themselves. It is not that foreign universities are the best faculty and we don't have. Every human being is bright, every human being can do well and our teachers are among the best and we have a share of very good teachers, right? The third thing that must be done by universities is to give flexible courses which satiate the curiosity of a young student. Don't regiment, don't create barriers to their freedom. And today the, the NEP gives you the freedom to opt in and out, to, you know, you know uh, to take whatever courses you want, majors, minors, credits, mix and match and take the degree over time. So the restrictions that were there earlier have gone away. This must be implemented and that means students come to universities to learn, to experiment, to have the joys of learning, of discovery. And learning is exhilarating, you know. Challenging the human mind to think, to interact, to debate, to question is exhilarating. It gives you new, new energy, it makes you happy, it makes you think and that is extraordinary, right? And that's what we want in people. We want people to be curious, we want people to learn. And I think they must do that, so create that environment and the flexibility. And then they must make sure that the culture is one of openness and transparency and collegialness. And we are going to be collegial. I think Indian universities should morph into uh, you know what uh, the global best universities have and you must remember at the end of the day universities are a function of the faculty the students and the administration the faculty should have the freedom to experiment they should be well paid they should have the facilities the students should have a culture which encourages learning and the flexibility and the administration should be such that it is very far reach far far looking and very open and committed to furthering the creation of greatest greater products to their students so it, it 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 has to be like this so you know but the biggest thing in any university to succeed is openness and democratic tradition and the ability to challenge anybody and debate no one single ideology or one thought should pervade a university let's be very clear there the challenge in many of india's universities had been that the Marxist thought has pervaded, they created shut shop, they, they shut out everybody else and they create narratives where only their narratives run, which is antithetical to any university and the idea of a university. Because the university is based on universal thought and there are no limitations to universal thought. There are no limitations to the human imagination. And this is what our universities do. I don't think that uh, we should be scared of any competition because please remember, universities exist for the students. They don't exist for itself. University exists for society, to further society, not for themselves. They are not uh, there because the faculty want jobs. They are there because we want to educate our next generation, pass on our knowledge, create more knowledge and create a better society. It is the instrument of improving the future of society and the future of young people and that's what must be kept in mind. And so long as you are open to thought, you know, we have the great uh, traditions, we will do well. So great. So you kept on mentioning about the contextual education. So India has been a land of entrepreneurs, but unfortunately we believe that education is alienating children from the real India. When I say the real India, the rural India, how do we create that entrepreneurial learning? How do we make them go back to their roots and villages and do something contextually? You see, first, the incoming batch of any institution of higher education to, to reflect the realities of society. What we do, by means of having certain tests, because we create a shortage of good institutions, we restrict the flow of students into a university. Fortunately, the reservation system has expanded the diversity of people coming into public university. Why is it important? Look, we live in society. Our society has rich people, middle class people, poor people, people living in rural areas, urban areas, people with cars, people walking, people with multiple religions, multiple languages, multiple practices. That's the reality of life. So our class should reflect the diversity of society. But our classes don't reflect the diversity of society because you have entrance tests, you have all kinds of things which are essential, I agree, but you must make efforts to do that. For example, in the class, there must be people who are creative in the arts. There must be sports people. There must be people who are mathematically inclined, people who are inclined in the social sciences. So this kind of an eclectic mix of young students will enhance the richness of our class, uh, class structure and the university and allow students to experience through the interaction with everybody what India really is. Now if you restrict it and take people from one strata of society who can afford to pay, who can who live in urban areas, you'll never know what this real India is. You'll become a small microcosm of a microcosm. 
which is very dangerous because you are not giving your students the ability to live in any part of the world and once you create this kind of a diversity within a class then you will make sure that your student after they graduate can live in any part of the world and do well that's what we want them to do they must be self assured people who are self motivated and who are not surprised by any event that happens in the world and that must be done so the badge has to be there and the teachers have to reflect that you see reservation policy has been criticized by many people because they say it uh, goes against the concept of merit merit is important i mean let's be very clear not everybody can take society forward only a small number of people have original thought spend time in scholarship and that is something that's a reality of life you cannot do away with that you cannot uh, meet create a, uh, create a sea of mediocrity you have to create a society of excellence where there's a great striving towards the truth and it depends on the individual where everybody gets a good education and some people want to spend more time on education and higher learning and they should have the opportunity it's not that everybody should do that but we must give good opportunities to everybody and that means the poor the dispossessed everybody should have equal opportunity and after that how they use the opportunity is left to them right so you cannot uh, keep people away and let me give you some data the latest i share report of the mhrd uh, says that uh, as of uh, march 20 i think uh, you know if you look at the composition of students in all our colleges sc makes up 16.6% of population they have 14.8% of students st makes up 8.2% uh, 8.8% .8 they are about 5.8% of population the so called backward community makes up 40% of population and they make up 36% the muslims make up 15% among the minor so called minorities they have only 5.2% and the rest are come from the so called the forward groups or whatever it is so there is a uh, reflection that the student cohort reflects the diversity of society to a great extent even though ger is only 27 that is only 27% of young people 18 to 23 go to college but is going up but the good news is among the sc st and uh, the muslim community the growth in enrollment year by year for the muslims is 7.5% and even they i think they see 7.2% so people who have not had access to education hitherto are now uh, seeing an expansion education i hope it goes up to 50 by the time we reach 2030 because i believe that every young child uh, should be able to get a college education at a at a reasonable cost and should not be deprived how they do further on in terms of research access is left to them we can't force that and make sure because above a point it has to be based on one's inclination one's aptitude and you cannot waste scarce resources on people uh, who may not want to do that right but we must give them a basic education because the college degree is like class 10 20 years ago right and this uh, the crucial period of a young person's life is 18 to 23 when they grow up and that's the time when they must be in an environment of great freedom of great interaction where they develop the social skills the communication skills and everything else that makes them better human beings in future and much more able to assimilate and work in society so there's been a great transformation through the education system in the last many years which we as a country must take a deep pride because i think among all countries in the world egalitarianism and access to education has been given to most people in this country and is expanding at a fast pace so we are becoming a country where you know we make sure that more and more people get equal opportunity which is the mandate of the constitution and we must be uh, proud of that and that is what i think makes for a great society so university has got a role and that diversity should be reflected in the class because other, apart from that if you're only urban how will you know about rural life all right if you're only urban will you want to go stay in the village and say i won't take up an exciting challenge of developing the village and the ecosystem because you have no emotional connect you don't know what a village life is even though today maybe i estimate 40 45% of people live in urban areas and the village as a community is, is declining and rightly right. so because uh, villages are not a uh, self sufficient economic system they cannot give people a chance to economically develop it's only the urban areas where there's concentration of human activity leading to specialization which leads to higher productivity and higher income is a way to live and there it can be uh, you know we can have a sustainable life right so i think if you do that you'll be able to take care of much of these challenges so it's truly appreciating to understand 
being from a corporate perspective right now we feel from educators being teachers there's a little trust deficit from the corporate in the education system of the country so this is very reassuring sir you mentioned about the national education policy you've been closely associated with that two uh, issues i'd like to raise in that you mentioned no, before that you spoke about the trust deficit let me tell you what is the trust deficit See, I meet a lot of vice chancellor, meeting them and all administrators. They always ask, why does an in industry interact with us? I ask them, why should industry interact with you? What do you have to offer industry? Do you offer them research? Do you offer them innovation? Do you offer them great knowledge? What is it you offer them that they don't have? I don't have access to. You must ask the question first. If you offer them research, innovation, great ideas, interaction, they'll come to you. What do you offer them? You cannot say, I'm an educator, I'm a professor, I'm a doctorate, so come to me and give me money, give me opportunities. Why will they come? So you must ask the question, why should society interact with you? Why should industry interact with you? Industries are engines of economic growth. Their focus is economic. Your focus is different, right? But what you discover should go into society to industry. And it has to be done that way. Because whatever you discover enhances the pool of knowledge society has and that has to go everywhere else. And for that, you have to ask this question. And what is the trust deficit? The trust deficit is you are not up to date. Because the product that you produce is not suited, is not fit for purpose. For example, in Infosys, uh, we set up the world's largest uh, uh, tech university where you could train 30,000 young people every year. So 650 computer science faculty, more than any university in the world, through a six-month program to create the cap human capital that we need. Because the colleges, universities, whether you IIT and we were not able to produce that. Because they were cloistered and they produced what they wanted. Yes, universities and faculty can say, our job is education, not training. Perfectly all right. But when you say our job is education, you must give the people the technical skills required for them when they go out of the university. At least enough of the technical skills which is up to date rather than very old knowledge. In many of the mechanical engineering courses, they still teach you about a carburetor. Carburetor is gone. There are no more carburetors in uh, cars, right? I mean, today uh, we have uh, different kind of engines. We have electric motors and all kind of stuff happening. Where are you teaching the latest subjects? When you don't do that because faculty has not upgraded their knowledge. The biggest challenge in university is the faculty. Because the faculty is slow moving. Faculties don't want to learn. They don't want to take on more load. They don't want to upgrade the knowledge because it takes a lot of effort. And they resist change. They're not forward looking. They have to be forward looking to succeed. Because you have to lead society. Universities have to lead society. If university leads society, industry follows, society will follow you. But you happen to stay back and pull things down and say that, oh, you know, we don't want to learn. This is what it is. We are great educators. Our job is to make a human being. We don't care whether they have the skills or not. That is an antiquated idea. Because in a modern society, 95% of people who graduate want a job. They have to fill the stomach three times a day. They have to leave economically. That's objective. In the earlier era, classical era, our objective is to make a great human being. Yes. But those days, very few people got educated. They were the leaders, they were the elite. The great majority didn't have access to education. Now the great majority have access to education, but they have to make a living, right? So you've got to understand this complexity and see that university is a place which is welcoming to outsiders and to industry and earn the trust of society because it takes society forward and society has a vested interest in the growth of the university. So, thank you. So you mentioned about NEP and a challenge of 50 GER by 2030. So are we going to be facing a typical debate between quantity and quality? I think that the bogus argument about quality and quantity, let's make it clear. And I think the IIT system has harmed this country by restricting the intake. Why should they restrict the intake? There's public money there. If uh, an IIT has 1,000, 2,000 students every year, it's fine. The faculty can teach them because you please remember if uh, 20 lakh young people write an exam for 15,000 seats, don't tell me the rest of them are not bright enough to learn and come. And what many people say is, the I, people who come out of the IIT or Indian science are very good and the top of uh, line of a population of one, uh, 140 crore people and whatever the teachers treat them is limited input. They are bright people, they could succeed anywhere. So what is so great about an institution polishing them and giving them something extra? 
So to think fallaciously that you know, oh, we got to squeeze the intake so that it will be there. For example, look at my uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants. Institute of Chartered Accounts has an open admission policy. Open admission policy means anybody can leave, anybody can write a test. If anybody can write a test and anybody can get an entry, the exit criteria is very tough. So you've got to have high standard to pass, but entry is much more open. In a in a IIT and all these universities, entry is very tough. Exit criteria is okay. You get a 4.5, a 4, uh, you know, CGPA, you are fine. You go out, right? So what is the big deal? So we got to create this this bogus argument about you know quantity. Do yes, there is a problem of the ability of the institution to handle a particular number. That's the restriction. But you can't. So we must allow more universities to come up, more universities to compete, universities to freely expand. So the good ones come up. What is the difference between a good university and a bad university? Leadership. A good university, a good leadership. A bad university, a bad leadership. If you're a good leader, you'll get good faculty. You'll give good, good experience to students, right? It's a leadership at the top. And can everybody, 1,100 units have the same kind of leadership? You cannot. Maybe 500 will have. Let them expand. Let there be a flight to quality. So what the NEP does is, NEP liberates the higher education system. Gives you flexibility. It writes down a set of principles you got to follow. The curriculum is left to you. You can change the curriculum. You can do what you want. Your students have the, it is student centric for the first time, not university centric, student centric because it says very clearly the university exists for the student. That means the students have a choice of subjects, mix and match, can go after one year, two years, three years, four years and they have the freedom to opt in and out and that's fantastic. They can have a bank of credit and all that. That means the responsibility of the university to create the environment for the student to grow uh, in the way they want to grow. Earlier, the student had to fit into the university. Now the university has to fit and meet the needs of the students. So I think it's fantastic. It liberates the system, opens up the system and allows the good ones to flourish and to come up and become role models. I think the NEP is fantastic. Great. So on NEP, allow me to go into this area. NEP greatly emphasized on the Indian knowledge system. So how do you look at that? I mean, how do we integrate look, it? How do you go about it? Look, we are Indians. Yeah. We are not Americans. We are not English. We are not French. We are Indians. And being Indians, the important thing that we need to understand is that we need to make sure that our students have an ability to understand and live in their own skin. So we have to live as Indians. So we have to understand our heritage. We have to understand what our civilization is because we have to live here. Yes, you can go to any country of the world and live. What is the point of reading Shakespeare if you don't read Kalidasa or Kuvempu or Bendre? What is the bar premchan? What is the point? I mean, Shakespeare is great world literature, but you know, you what is the point of learning about the Iliad and the Odessa when you don't learn the Ramayana and the Mahabharata? Because the Ramayana and Mahabharata is what we are. And that's what you should learn. So we should learn the Vedas and the Upanishad because that's the accumulated knowledge of a civilization. So the Indian knowledge system is something that all Indians should learn. And I think the Indian knowledge system should be taught to all the students so they get an exposure to what it is. Of course, they must learn about science and technology, which is global. They must learn about world history, which is very global. And they must read all the things so that we should learn about ourselves, our society, our cities, our state, our culture. And on top of that, we must learn about the world because we live in this globalized world. So I think it's fantastic and I'm sure the emphasis there. See, for many long years in the Nehruan era, there was disdain for being an Indian. Nehru, in my view, was an European in the Indian skin. So he always admired Europe and what Europe did because India had been impoverished. India was a poor country. He didn't have any great respect for Indian tradition. So brought in Western civilization, Western concept, which was maybe okay. Because you know, we need to know the world, there's nothing wrong in it, but overemphasize that to the detriment of our own knowledge system. So you create a generation of young students who are insecure in being individuals and living in this country. That's why you see most of the bureaucrats, most of the so-called highly educated send their children abroad. They don't want them to live in India. They want them to stay outside. They think the good Indians, if we send out their children, if the bureaucrats rule this country, the politicians rule this country, send their children outside, they reside there. What is the commitment to this country? I firmly believe as you grow older, our commitment to our country is enhanced. If our children live here and the future is linked to us, to this country, 
you send off your children there and they leave abroad and they go for holiday to the US or somewhere else and say, oh, I live in Texas somewhere, I live in London. What is the point? Where is your commitment to this country? You're just spending time. So I think it's important we reach our tradition, we empower them, they feel secure in their own skin as Indians because we are Indians, we are a diverse country and then they can go anywhere and stay, it's fine. I mean, as free people of a free country, you can go to any country and stay, that's fine, that's your choice. But in education, we have to show them that and then that's very important. Sir, thank you. Allow me to take this question from an audience, sir. Say, so you mentioned that knowledge dissemination along with knowledge creation is essential. In the knowledge era, how do universities look at creating knowledge? See, creation of knowledge only comes when faculty and students start thinking about things that are not there. About, that, about phenomena, why do things happen, how do they happen and expand the field of knowledge. And they of course have to build on what has already been discovered by others and build on that because it makes the path easier. So they have to spend enough time on that. Second, they need to have the time to study, to understand what is happening, all the advances and to work out in new areas. And third, they need the money to set up labs and experiment and use technology. All these things are required. So I think this can come if we reduce the teachers teaching load on teachers who have an aptitude for research. Not every teacher has an aptitude for research, it's fine. If 10% have an aptitude for research, reduce the load, give them the tools, give them the time, give them the ability to interact with people, give them the money to travel, meet people, and they will expand the knowledge. And that knowledge will be built in the university, which will be disseminated in the lectures and discussion with students. And allow students who have a penchant for discovery, for learning, to interact with them and to work with them in the labs and other places. And that's what we should do to change the way a university is configured and reduce the teaching load. Because look, a human being, a teacher is a human being. You have a family. You got only seven, eight hours to work a day. You can't spend 14 to seven hours teaching, then five hours doing research. You have to spend time with your family. You have to spend uh, time understanding life and going around with your friends, whatever it is. You are a human being. And you know, you can't constrict them, right? So you got to reduce the load within the university system and give them the scope and uh, give it some, some could some could teach, some could do pure research, some could do a bit of miss and match and that environment is required and same thing for the students and that's how we can enhance the field of knowledge. So this is a question being a consultant for NEP also head of Manipal Global Education question says, so what is the greatest one single tool for achieving social justice as per NEP? What do institutions do? I think the greatest tool for achieving social justice is to open up the higher education system and give give the give the universities full autonomy to all those who have a certain standard, and along with that, make sure that no child and no young person is deprived of access to higher education because of want of means. So, what is social justice? Social justice means every young person born in this country, irrespective of background, irrespective of ethnicity, irrespective of identity, irrespective of means, is given equal access to all the things that can help improve the standing and the ability to do well in society. And one of the biggest among them is education, particularly higher education. Now, higher education is expensive. Somebody has to pay. But if I'm not able to pay, I should have access to scholarships. I should have access to free ship and not too much of loans because you know it enhances the cost and society must invest. Government must invest more. Society must invest more. We must get uh, people with money to give scholarships and you know expand the pool of people because students are our future. That's our future. If you want a good society, you have to educate your young people. You can't go into the workforce semi-educated and without access. And if you do that, social justice automatically comes up. Because the greatest tool of empowerment for an individual is education. The greatest tool. What else is there? Because you can do well if you have a good education and you know what to do. And that social justice to me means giving access to education irrespective of who you are. And making sure if you don't have the means, uh, you get enough uh, scholarships and everything else. Please remember, they say Pandit Nehru started uh, four or five IITs and all that. Please remember, he did not focus on primary education. Hundreds of children paid a price of a lack of literacy in education to send one student to the IIT of whom 70-75% left the country to go to the United States and elsewhere in the first 30 years. Remember that. They paid a price. Who paid the price? In a poor country, who paid the price? Yes, we need higher education. We need research. But we need basic literacy. 
basic literacy, basic education should be given to everybody. That is the first charge. That is the first charge. And then basic health should be given so people live a productive life. Both the things we missed. There's nothing wrong in lifting IIT. I don't want to say anything on that. But if the priorities are mixed up and you try to create an elitism in a democratic society, you will end up poor. And you will end up in a culture where a small set of people try to capture the goodies of a society and try to rule everybody else. We have to create a society where young people get equal opportunities. There is, uh, there is universal literacy, universal access to primary health and opportunities so that people can discover their own self. And that's what we must do. And that's what happened after 91 when the economy has to grow. Because for that, the economy has to grow. We need economic growth. So in that context, there's a question related to that as well. My question to you would be, how do we attract the world towards India? What is it the world wants to learn from India? So being a university or a place of learning, how do we teach Look, if you want the world to be attracted to India, you must give the world what it wants. What does the world want? Top level knowledge, innovation, cutting edge research, cutting edge science, cutting edge technology, cutting edge philosophy, thinking and then opportunities to use that. So if you look at the United States, which is possibly the greatest knowledge power, what does it offer? Great universities where the best minds in the world come and work. They are paid very well. Money for doing research, so they can spend their time on knowledge creation. A vibrant economy of $23 trillion which uses them and which gives them the opportunity, right? And then spending on science and technology by the government, which enhances opportunities. Now, when students from all over the world go there, uh, after education, they can get a job easily and earn a good living. If a foreigner comes to India, gets education, can the foreigner live in India and get a good job? There's too much of competition in this country. That's not possible because our uh, income levels are much smaller, right? So what we can do is in certain areas of expertise, we can open up to say any young person from the world can come here and get education at a much lower cost with high quality so that um, possibly they're better off. But can they live here and build build their careers? That's difficult. So in that context, allow me this question. There's a question which has come from the audience which says that there was an observation recently by a Chief Justice of India which say that the world is moving towards Western thought. So how do we fight this perception that Indian values and thoughts perspectives are important and relevant? I don't know. I think the judge is too infatuated with the Western thought. There's nothing like Western thought, Eastern thought. There's only good thought. Right. And like I said, you know, if you think that Western thought dominates, which it does to a great extent, because much of the creation of knowledge happened there. And that's what you should remind you are mistaken. Because, you know, you must imbibe the best thoughts globally, including your thought. Like I said, the basic thought that you must have is about yourself, your civilization, what it has to offer and the best thoughts globally. That is true. Right. But the world is going to let the start. That's because of Western hegemony. That's because of the Western domination of economic thought. I mean, the whole world is going towards China. Why China? Because China has become a rich country. It is spending money in attracting good scholars, right? And you know, is leading the world in many areas of innovation. So if you want something, you should go there. In the ancient world, why did the Chinese go west? Journey to the west is a great epic in China, where a, a, Buddhist, a Buddhist sage came to India to study in Nalanda. Remember that? And why did they come? Because knowledge was here. So you create knowledge, people will come. So Western thought, that is the infatuation of the West. I'm not against the West. Please, we must learn the best thoughts from any country, irrespective of origin. But we must also learn about ourselves and about what we are, so that we are self-assured in whatever we are. We are not a white American or a white Englishman or a white German. We are not a Japanese. We are not a Chinese. We are Indians. So we must learn about the situation where we are born and then learn about the best world. I think that's an important thing. Great, sir. So in this context, coming to the end of this beautiful conversation, we are very proud that you, you are associated with Chanakya University. So what would be your expectation from a no, university? My expectation is Chanakya University becomes a leader in higher education in India. It creates an ecosystem where the brightest young minds of this country want to come and learn. It creates an ecosystem where the faculty is open, transparent and collegial, devoted to the expansion of knowledge and to interaction with students. It, uh, it, 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 it becomes a place where great research and great thinking and great debates happen. And it becomes a place which gets the respect of society because it contributes to society. Because these are all generic principles. 
because we can only express our uh, aspiration to generic principles. What it exactly means is for the university to uh, develop. For example, the university has to earn the respect of society. Why will society respect you if you're not having the highest quality? Why will society respect you if you don't have great thought leaders and people who lead by example? Why will society respect you if you're wedded to mediocrity and not to excellence? And why will society respect you if you don't interact with society and work with them and include society in what you do? So these are the questions the university should answer and I hope they'll answer in a manner where they'll justify the name. Remember what Chanakya stands for. Chanakya stood for the epitome of scholarship. Chanakya stood for great thoughts. Chanakya stood for an intellectual challenge to despotism. He never bowed his, bowed his head before insolent might. And that's what uh, Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore spoke about in the Gitanjali. Right? You know, so we must create that environment as is there in the Gitanjali, which speaks about, you know, uh, into the heaven of freedom, my father let my country away. So this must be a heaven of freedom in higher education. And that's the culture that has to be created. So I hope the top administration, the faculty and everybody will do that right from the beginning because that will what will make you successful. Because you know, if you are a teacher or an administrator after spending 25, 30 years of your life in a university, when you look back, you got to look back and ask yourself the question, what have I achieved? What have I done? Have I expanded the field of knowledge? Have I earned the respect of all my students? Have I earned the respect of society? because I'm a teacher, because the teacher in our society is placed at the top of the totem pole. And you must all justify the confidence and the expectation society has in you. It's a great responsibility. So I think it's very, teachers are special, they are revered, but uh, they also have to discharge the responsibility. And that's what I expect the university to do. So it's been an honor and pleasure. On that note, I'm. I know, I'm sure the conversation could go on, but uh, it's been so enriching. It's an honor to have you, sir, on behalf of Chanakya University and the people watching this show on, on behalf of my team. I take the pleasure to thank you, sir, thank you. for your interaction. It's thank been you. truly enriching. Thank you so much. Thank you.